he, he had a, a story one day I thought was really, really interesting. He said um, he, he would go out with these birds and he would let them forage on, as they were becoming adults. And when some, every now and then, one would like leave and he would have to go find it, like follow it and come on, let's go back home. Mm -hmm. And one day this, this, this hen. Um, welcome back to the Voyage Outdoor podcast. Today we have um, Dr. Mike Chamberlain. Um, and thanks, Mike, for jumping on. I appreciate not a, it. Not a problem, Seth. Didn't and you go it. by you go by Mike, correct? Is that yes. all right? Yep. Okay. Awesome. So let's go ahead and get started. Let's for people that don't listen that don't know what you do and where you know you work and what you uh, do for a day job. Kind of walk me through um, what you do now and kind of how you got there. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm a researcher at the University of Georgia. I've been here for I'm going into my 11th year now. Uh, before I came here, I worked at Louisiana State University, pretty much in the same position that I'm that I'm in now. Uh, when I was there, and up until recently, I also taught classes. I don't I don't teach anymore. I'm solely a researcher now. So uh, my path here was was pretty straightforward, actually. I was was fortunate. I I grew up in Virginia. I uh, went to Virginia Tech and did a, an undergraduate in wildlife science got up an offer to go to graduate school and and I went to Mississippi State where I did both a, a master's and a PhD there studying turkeys among other things and then I I landed a faculty position at LSU right out of grad school which is pretty much unheard of I yeah. I got really fortunate um, and was able to, to do well in the position that I was in and you know fast forward tw more than 20 years and here I here I am in Athens, Georgia, and uh, living the life, man. The the my day to day job is chaos. I mean, honestly, it's um because I have graduate students working for me. They're all over the country doing field studies. They're doing the work that I get credit for. Honestly, they're the they're the engine behind you know what I do. And they work really hard and they're really talented and, and I appreciate their efforts. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of herding cats. I'm, I'm the person that gets the grant money to support the projects. I'm the person that's responsible for reporting. And I write a lot, you know, I do podcasts like this. I, I do a lot of work on social media, trying to inform people about the research that I do. And, and that pretty much burns up most of my time, you know, we're sitting here in the summer and summer's a really busy time for me actually it's it's when i i can write a lot in the summer because things have, have settled down usually and this year doesn't seem to be that that case but usually things settle down and i can write a lot during the summer um which is good because i can i can help my students kind of make sense of what they're seeing in their field research and and that's where that's enjoyable to me because you, you see the fruits of, you know, of their labor, if you will, when you can start yeah. making sense of the data. Yeah. Now the, the, the kids that are, are the, not kids, the, the, the people doing, going through that and doing those research, what is their degree um, that they're pursuing at the university of Georgia? What's that title? Yeah. So I have some master's students. So that, that would be, they, they finished their, their bachelor's degree and they're now working towards a master of science master's in science. wildlife ecology and, and management. And then I have doctoral students that are studying, excuse me, towards their PhD. And those are typically broader type, like the names of the degrees are broader, you know, forest resources or, I mean, it's, yeah, it, it's typically much broader than, than a master's degree, but the bottom line is they're doing some of the same research. It's just, uh, it's just what universities choose to, to name the degree. Yeah. I was curious about that because I've seen you had students and I was like, man, I wonder what their degree was and what they're pursuing toward. Now, do you keep a lot of them? How do you keep a lot of people staffed on after they graduate or they kind of go out and, uh, and look for jobs elsewhere? It really depends. I mean, I have, I have some students that 
for instance, I have a postdoctoral researcher now who just recently graduated with his PhD and he's, st he's staying on for a couple of years to do postdoctoral work. And, you know, but most of my students, you know, when, when they finish with whatever degree they're working on, they either go into the job market or they continue with degree work. I, for instance, I have a student that she's about to leave my lab with a master's degree and she'll start in, in at Tennessee Tech University in August on a PhD degree working on a turkey project in Kentucky that we're doing. So it, it really just depends on the student. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I was curious about that. But yeah, so I kind of want to just jump on in um, and just kind of dive into a few things that I want to know. I know other people want to know. I actually had um, friends of mine call me whenever I told them that you were coming on. They had some questions for, the, for you as well. So my first question would be, I guess, centered around what is the most surprising thing over the last 11 years, you doing this for 20 years, that you've seen um, with the Turkey research that the general public, you'd love for the general public to just know the most surprising thing about the Turkey population. I know it's mm. a very broad question too. I was just yeah. really curious of what some things were that really just surprised you in researching turkeys that the average person just wouldn't know. Yeah. A few things stick out to me. I think one of the, one of the things that I've, I think all of us that, that work together and you know, I work with a number of colleagues at other institutions and have for years. I think one thing that has been really surprising is how variable turkeys are from one bird to the next in regards to how they behave. There, there's no such thing as an average turkey. They don't, they have wildly different behaviors from one bird to the next. We see this with toms and hens, really. It's, um, it's pretty dramatic how variable. So if you kind of plot out on a graph, just pick something, home range size or how far they move in a day or whatever it is, how they respond to hunting pressure or whatever. And you plot, you know, 20 birds, none of the birds are the average. Like they're all from the low end to the high end. And it just speaks to how much variation you see across birds and their behaviors. That's one thing that's really stuck out to me. So with turkeys, whenever you guys, whenever you guys kind of, you know, keep track of them and all that, do hens, I mean, do they tend when it, when it's time for them to, you know, lay and all that, do they, they, they tend to stay together or they just kind of go out and do their own thing um, when it comes time for that. Yeah. What they do is they, so hens will, once they split from their winter flocks, let's just say you have 20 that are in a flock, they'll, they'll break up into these little small social groups that are like, let's say three to five and they'll hang around together. Those birds will typically either be shadowed by a group of toms or they'll go visit, you know, toms that are displaying. And then as soon as the bird, those three or five, three to five hens will stay together until they start incubating. So while they're going through their laying sequence, those birds are still hanging around with each other. But, and, and if you turkey hunt, you see this a lot. So like the birds will fly down in the morning and there's four or five hens together. And then at 10 o'clock, one's missing. And then at 11 o'clock, another one's missing. And then at two o'clock, the, the hens are all alone. They're off laying. And then they get back together, you know, a couple hours later. And then you see them in the afternoon, late in the afternoon. And lo and behold, all four or five are together again. What they're doing then is they're separating from each other to isolate themselves because they don't want to draw attention to their nest site. Um, so they're, they're, they'll go alone, you know, so they'll split from each other, go lay an egg and then kind of get back together as the day progresses. Um, and that makes sense. I didn't know that they, so I didn't know that they were thinking, Hey, we don't want to draw attention to our nest site. So they're fully aware of where their nests are. They, they keep try to keep them as safe as possible. Um, now you, I've seen you do some research of, I saw something the other day where they talked about if they lose that, that nest, 
Um, how many times they'll go and they'll, they'll hatch again. How many times will they do that? Um, you know, lay in, in, in the spring, their time, how many times will they attempt that? I mean, as many times as they're bred or how does that kind of work? No, uh, it, it typically, you know, most, most hens will lay one clutch. And then within that group that you see anywhere from you know, really low percentages to say 40 or 50% will try second nest if they lose that first one. Very few will try a third nest. And literally, a, we've had, a, I think, less than five through the years out of a thousand that tried four times in a year. So most are one and two maybe, and then that's, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's dictated by a number of factors. One would be her body condition, you know, can she support attempting multiple clutches? Uh, two would be whether she has access to, to breeding toms. Um, yeah. because like that post I made the other day that, you know, those, those birds, one of those birds in, in that pose, she laid her first clutch in early April and she laid her second clutch in the, in middle of June. So there were, you know, there's two months elapsed and she couldn't have stored viable sperm for that long from her first breeding. So she had to have been bred after she lost her first nest which was in the you know the late may yeah so she was still receptive to breeding and there was a tom out there that was you know that was yeah. still capable of breeding you know in late may yeah um and i and before we kind of got cut off you were talking about the most surprising thing it's kind of been how just different every bird is um when it comes to when it comes to land i think the biggest question i had was um, with the turkeys being so different, uh, we've focused our whole lives on how do we make our property accept, you know, acceptable to white-tailed deer. But I don't think I've ever asked the question or even researched the answer. How do you make a property uh, suitable and better for the wild turkeys? Like if you had a property, 100 acres, you know, 50% woods, 50% uh, open fields, what can landowners do to make it a better spot for turkeys? Yeah, it really just depends on, you know, unlike whitetails who their their annual cycle is, you know, they pretty much are using the same plant communities all year. Um, turkeys, on the other hand, dramatically alter how they behave. So like, it, you know, in the fall and winter, they're they're attracted to food resources, whether you're in you know, if you're in areas with, with oaks, then they're going to be looking for acorns. And if you're in areas that have waste grain and agricultural crops, they're going to be there. And, and then suddenly come spring, they shift entirely to kind of early successional plant communities um, that they, they breed in. You know, they can see, yeah. they can move around in. And then all of a sudden the hens are in really thick stuff, you know, nesting. And then if they're lucky enough to hatch, they immediately move to something that doesn't look anything like nesting habitat where poults can move around freely. And then by the end of the summer, they're, you know, they're back to what they were doing in the fall. So it, it really depends on, I say this a lot, what your strong suit is. If you have a hundred acres and, you know, 50% of it is, is open, 50% of it is, is oak forest, let's say hardwood forest. Well, then you're probably going to have some birds moving through your property in the winter, perhaps, but they're not going to stay on that property because their home ranges are enormous in the winter. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you, we have birds routinely that cover 5,000 acres in a month. You know, they, they move a lot in the, wall, in the winter. So, you know, I tell people, hey, if you got 100 acres and you, you see birds only during the winter, Okay, we'll try to figure out a way that that you can improve the property during the time that birds are using your property. And I, the reason I say that is because what you see with turkeys is they have a really strong fidelity to where they breed. In other words, uh, they shift their home ranges from winter into spring. And that may be 
one farm to the next, or it could be two miles down the road. And, and they do this repeatedly every year. So they go to the same areas to, to breed. And they, they do that. They've been doing that for generations. And this is why you, you will often, you know, talk to people and, yeah, I hear birds. I don't ever see turkeys until March. And then suddenly they're on my property and they're always roosted in that area or in this area over here. That's because they're shifting their range to breed in that area. It, so is there something about that, that second range, so to say, where they go in the, in the spring, is there something about the landscape that farm or is it, they just shift their range no matter how, where they're at in the winter, they're going to shift in the spring, no matter what, or is there, there something about that location in the spring that they love to breed in? Or it's be really in? both. I mean, oh. that, very rarely do you see birds not shift some from their winter ranges to their spring ranges because in the winter, again, they're like here in the deep South, they're, they're closely tied to hardwoods. Mm. and they that hardwoods are not typically breeding habitat i mean they'll they'll continue to you know they'll roost in hardwoods and they'll strut and they'll breed in hardwoods but those hens are moving in a lot of cases to other places within their range to to nest so you typically will see a shift how far that shift occurs really depends a lot on what's there yeah yeah um, the landscape and yeah. housing and people and um, yeah, I was really curious about that just because I think I've focused so hard on, like I said, the deer, how to make my property <laughs> right for whitetail. Right. And then I was curious to how, um, to make it right for turkeys, but it sounds like turkeys will have their home range, um, for the spring and the winter kind of built into their, they know where they're going to go every spring. And I was just curious to see if there was any research on just if that property was different. Right. And so that was, that's interesting. Um, but um, the, la the second thing I kind of wanted to move into, um, it's obviously, I think the biggest topic in the turkey hunting world is just the decline of turkeys. I've listened to you talk about it, you know, 20 times on 20 other, you know, shows and podcasts, but I still want to kind of talk about it. Um, I guess I've heard a lot of theories and I've heard you kind of explain it, but kind of explain it again to people watching of like, like just the numbers of how much it shows, how much the decline is, especially in Arkansas, uh, we're in Missouri. Um, and then also kind of Missouri, how they're looking as far as Turkey numbers, if you know, and then explain maybe some of the reasoning behind why that's happening. Yeah. I mean, the declines across the South and East and, and in, and now in areas of the Midwest is pretty, has been pretty dramatic. You know, we've been seeing these declines for several decades now, primarily through production indices. And what I mean by that is the number of young turkeys produced per adult has been declining in the South, for instance, for 20 years now. And the declines from one year to the next are not that dramatic. But when you look at data across 20 years, yeah. you know, it's, it's, we're producing half as many young birds as we were 20 years ago in most states in the South. And at the same time, you know, the, the turkey hunting craze has, is so dramatically different now than it was 20 years ago. Yeah. yeah. And the landscape doesn't look like it did 20 years ago. And you, you kind of put all, you know, predator communities, for instance, are at a historic apex now, you know, the things that eat turkeys, whether it's birds of prey, fur bearing mammals, their populations are at all time highs. So you put all of that together, you, you're producing fewer birds, the habitat that you're providing them is not as, as good a quality as it was. There's less of that habitat. The predators that are using those, that, those same landscapes are more abundant now than they were historically. Uh, harvest of this bird is, is, is higher than it used to be in the spring. Mm -hmm. um, and you tag all that together, and it shouldn't be surprising that we're seeing these, these declines. And, and the, the problem is it's not, it's impossible to put your finger on it's on one thing. And, and people ask me this all the time. And I see people on social media that it's Label it as a, yeah, this, this is, is the reason. problem. Yeah. I see well, that's one, that could be one of the problems, but you know, I use the analogy of, you know, a football 
field, if you will. You, you've got a, you got all these positions that are influencing the outcome of the game. And in one game, certain positions are more impactful on the outcome than the others. And then the next game, which could be the next state or the next county or whatever, different positions are influencing the outcome. Um, yeah. trying to pick one position and say that won or lost the game, you know, coaches will tell you that's that's nonsense. Um, this is a team sport, right? Well, that's what we're dealing with with turkeys. There's not a smoking gun. There's not one position on the field that's that's driving the outcome. It's all those positions are interacting, recognizing that in some areas, one position is much more impactful than the others. But the bottom line is we're still losing – the outcome is we're losing more games than we're winning each year. That's the outcome. Yeah, and I'm guessing there's already a ton of conversation around that at the highest level, and then you know the the Turkey Federation and all that. What what are some things you think we will see down the road to combat that um, issue, or will we? It be a while before we take any type of steps of like maybe I'm just shooting ball in here, shorter season, higher predator control. I don't know how they're going to get there, but just kind of what do you see down the road to kind of help combat this? Well, I mean, what you're seeing already is that, you know, agencies, many agencies have made changes to to their harvest and people will say, well, what, you know, you being agencies, agencies need to do, you know, they need to worry about the, you know, habitat and they need to worry about predators and they need to worry about this, that, and the other. And if you, if you go talk with agency you know, decision makers, <clears throat> they will tell you, and they're correct. You know, agencies can't control what private landowners do. Agencies can't control predators at a broad scale. Agencies have, you know, they have authority over public lands in their states. And public lands, at least in the East, are, you know, a small percentage of the total land base. Yeah. So they don't really have control over anything at a broad scale other than harvest. So that's where they, that's where they start making changes, which is why you've seen, you know, there's a bunch of States in the past three or four years that have made, you know, bag limit changes. They've, they've changed the timing of the season. They've reduced mm-hmm. fall seasons you know, in hopes of reducing the, um, the number of birds that are being killed and when they're being killed hoping that it will have a tangible improvement, you know, on a population level. So that's, you know, you're going to continue to see that. I I think it's, I don't think, I I know, I know, I know because I hear the conversations. There are a number of states that are implementing changes now that you'll hear about next year or you'll hear about two years from now because of how regulation cycles work. There's a lot of agencies that are that are going to be making changes because um, even in areas where you don't think you see a problem, the agencies are seeing a problem. You know, states out in the western U.S., for instance, are, are seeing the same declines that we are in the east. Yeah, yeah, I've heard, um, I've heard that. So I, I think what you're going to see through time, unfortunately, is more changes to harvest regulations that are going to be designed to reduce the number of birds that are being harvested. And unfortunately, what what I see now, which I never thought I would see, is that we have a supply and demand issue with turkeys in a lot of areas. We have more demand than we have supply. And when you, I mean, you you know, this basic economics, when you run into a problem with supply and demand, you have to reduce the demand and, or you increase the supply. Or both. Yeah. yeah. Supply is decreasing in in most areas. So you have to reduce demand. Yeah. And this is probably an unpopular opinion, but uh, Missouri has a fall turkey season. And, you know, you can shoot one with your bow the whole archery season with your bow, which is difficult to do. But still, I've never understood. I don't know if there's any benefit to a fall turkey season. I've, I've kind of thought for the last two years that's something that. I wouldn't mind see it go away. I don't know how many turkeys are killed in the fall. Um, you know, not full on, on those numbers, but I I could see go away with that. And and because of, I mean, the whole point of this is to to manage the population of an animal by hunting the animal. And if the population is declining, you know, um, 
then, then what, what are we hunting them so much for? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. They bring food to our table. But at the same time, there's a, there's a level there of we're managing the, the amount of them. Same with predators. I think there should be more predator incentives to get out there and you can, you know, so cause of the rise of them, but yeah, I don't want to go too far into that, but yeah, that was my whole thing is I thought kind of Missouri could really go away and then they might, you know, they might reduce those that time and they might reduce uh, seasons, which, I'm, I'm on board for, I want to see the population of turkeys grow and then be abundant. I remember as a kid, I mean, when I was, I think 10, first time I went out and we had seven gobbles to choose from so many, like it was, just, that was 20 years ago. So it was like, it's definitely, you can see and feel it when you're hunting as well as probably, you know, sure. um, but yeah. Yeah. And you know, the fall harvest thing is a, that's a, that's a hot topic. And, and I, mm-hmm. I will say this and it, it will not be popular with, with some people. And I get it. I grew up fall hunting turkeys. Yeah. Um, that's, that's how I became a turkey hunter was, was harvesting birds in the fall. And at that time, when I was a kid, spring hunting was brand new. It was just getting started. And you know that, yeah. And we, you know, we loved it, but, but I killed more birds in my teen years in the fall than I ever even contemplated killing in the spring. And, mm. and, you know, I, f- I fast forward now to where we are today. And if you look back, you know, fall season started as a way to do two things. To one, allow more birds to be killed because turkeys were doing really well. And two, to provide more opportunity for hunters. So you had a resource that was increasing and you had, um, you had this, this idea, of, okay, well, we will let people have opportunity to harvest this bird uh, in a broader time span than just the spring. Well, now you fast forward to where we are today and you see declining populations. And, and, you know, I'll use Missouri as an example. So I looked back at the fall harvest in Missouri for the past five years. And I want to say, you know, it was several thousand birds that were harvested. Um, I could pull them. Let's just say we'll pull a figure. Yeah. Let's just say that 5,000 birds are killed in a state. Well, if the population is declining and you're killing 5,000 birds at a time of year that's outside of the breeding season, in the turkeys example, fall harvest is disproportionately skewed towards females and juveniles. Most fall kill, it's not toms. Toms yeah. are really hard to kill in the fall. So, I, I use this scenario. Most turkey nests fail in the spring. We're seeing declining production. We know that most of the poults that are produced in a population are produced by a very small segment of hens, right? It's a very small segment of hens that are producing most of the poults. And those hens are early nesting hens, and early nesting hens are dominant hens. We know that. So these birds are busting their tails to produce a small number of young birds every year. And then you go in the fall and you kill some of those young birds. And a lot of those young birds are females. So you've got a tiny percentage of hens, the best hens, producing this segment of young birds and you're carving off a couple thousand of them in the fall. When you do that, they never existed. Until they're an adult, they never existed from a breeding standpoint. So until that hen makes it to her first spring, she didn't exist. And until that Jake makes it until he's two years old, he didn't exist. So in many ways, in, in my eyes, fall harvest where you're seeing dramatic declines of a population is nonsensical. From a biological standpoint, it doesn't make any sense to do it. Now, totally agree. But yeah. states, again, states are, you know, they're in this tricky situation because they're they're trying to provide opportunity. Yeah. And I grew up doing this activity. I know yeah. it's it's enjoyable. So I understand the 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 mindset of, you know what, I enjoy fall turkey hunting. It's something that I really enjoy and and I get that. Yeah. But with the declines we're seeing, I, I know agencies are are starting to look at, okay. Does killing a couple thousand hens matter? Well, the way I look at it, 
fall harvest can only have three impacts on the population. It can help it, which I think no sensible person would yeah. say that. It doesn't yeah. help the population. It has no impact or it has a negative impact. Well, if the only two options are it doesn't matter or it really does matter, and likely we're somewhere in between, and if that's yeah. the case, it really doesn't make sense. And in my my eyes, if your population is declining, to to do that. But I don't make the regulations, obviously. Yeah, and that's why I kind of brought that up. I didn't know how you kind of felt about fall season. I've just always and and it's probably a little biased for me because I didn't grow up enjoying fall season. I've killed a uh, a tom with my bow in the fall. Um, that was my first ever turkey kill. Actually, my first bow first bow kill at like fifteen or twelve years old. First turkey kill all at one time, but. Still, I, I didn't enjoy it. So maybe that's why I'm, I don't see any. And then the hen aspect, I just, I've always thought like, I, I, I wouldn't mind, like if this goes away, like I wouldn't mind. So maybe that's just something to combat the population. And you kind of dove in and explained it really well. But, and also I think another thing too, is I don't think they'll see as much pushback if they got rid of a fall season in Missouri. Um, and the only reason I say that is, you know, there, there's a small group or a group that would be, I think generally, you know, a little upset about that, but a lot of people I know, they're out bow hunting. They see a turkey. They have their turkey archery tag. It's well, an opportunity, yeah. It's an yep. opportunity, mm -hmm. right? They're whitetail hunting. They're not They're not turkey hunting. That's how mm -hmm. I shot my turkey. It's like, you know, if that opportunity isn't in there, like I don't have that tag, I don't think they're going to care. If they mm -hmm. see a turkey, they're going to be like, oh, turkey, you know, um, you know, I don't know. I don't know how people will react, but I, I mean, I don't think it really matters what people – react really i think it's about the turkey and the turkey population yeah and what's best for them I, you know i have some close friends that that i you know people that i grew up with that i know i mean they're good fall turkey hunters i, I have friends that are accomplished fall turkey hunters yeah and they they it's not an you know uh, they're deer hunting and take a bird it's they go turkey hunt turkey and, fall, and yeah. they enjoy it and and i did too and you know when i grew up you know, we, we had a, our turkey population in Virginia at the time was, was increasing. And it appears that Virginia's population is still doing quite well, particularly in Eastern parts of the state. And if that's the case, you know, you look at some of the Western states and some of the Northeastern and upper Midwest states, populations appear to be doing quite well. Okay. Well then support a fall harvest. If, if all of the evidence suggests that it, it doesn't matter and it's not impactful, then allow it. But I, I think, you know, states where the population is not doing well. Arkansas, right? I, yeah, I think they are looking at, I, know, I mean, I know they are. I know there's a number of states that are looking at, should we change our fall harvest, you know, in a way where we still give opportunity, but we minimize the impact. And, and you know, my home state of Virginia did this years ago. We used to be able to kill turkeys the entire deer season, the entire fall. And through time, what you've seen Virginia do is they just shorten the season and they have, you know, seasons within seasons where, okay, these few weeks you can kill a bird and then the rest of the time you can't. And by doing that, they've been able to effectively allow people like us to still have the opportunity to, to take a bird in the fall, but they minimize the impact impact on the population. And I think a number of states are, are looking at that same model. But it's interesting. I heard you talk about Arkansas. I had no idea. I mean, I'm in Springfield, Branson, Missouri area. So I'm really close to the Arkansas um, line there. Um, are they probably the largest decline of turkeys just in this Midwest to Southeast kind of area? Uh, no, but they are they are, they get a lot of attention for their decline because of how dramatic it's been. But if you look at many other states, they're headed in the same direction Arkansas has been. In fact, the trajectories are identical um, in a number of states. And, you know, Arkansas is a good example of, you know, if you look at a case history of what has, has happened in Arkansas, you know, you have, large chunks of private uh, of public land, the Wachita's, the Ozarks, you have, you know, changing management on those public acreages. You, you have, um, 
or dramatic land base. You know, you go from Northwest Arkansas down to Southeast Arkansas, you wouldn't even know you're in the same state. It's a very diverse state. There, you know, landscapes there are influenced by all dramatically different things as you move about Arkansas. And, you know, Arkansas was a popular state for turkey hunting and always has been. You know, they have a rich history of turkey hunting in that state. And and as you've kind of watched the, the, the decline through time, you know, the agency at one point had made, I think, 20 regulations changes in 30 years trying to trying to, to figure out, you know, yeah. what to do. And now, you know, if you look at Arkansas's spring season framework, it's it's very aggressive. It's 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 based on the biology of the bird. Um, yeah. You know, they have a, a later opening date than many states. They have a low bag limit. Uh, they have a Jake rule. You know, I mean, they've, they've gone as aggressive as they think they needed to be to minimize the impact of spring harvest because the declines have been so dramatic. But again, yeah. if, you, if you look at the trajectory in Arkansas and you look at other states, there are a number of other states that look the same. They're just, they're just a little bit behind Arkansas. Behind. Yeah. 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 And I, I figured, I mean, I listened to you talk about that before and you, you've kind of said that they're, it's the same, it's just a couple of years behind. So, uh, Hey, hats off to Arkansas for, I didn't know the changes they made. I haven't turkey hunted there. Um, well, that's awesome. They're trying to combat that and kind of get on top of that, but I, I kind of want to, um, move on from that. That's I'm glad we kind of went into that and you gave us a bunch of good information on that as well. So I kind of want to go into, just some things for the listeners, maybe some like knowledge on how toms react in the spring um, when it comes to breeding. I think I've, we've all seen just so many different things with toms and hens. Um, something I you know I hear a lot is uh, from different people, and I'm not an experienced turkey hunter by any means, um, but when toms, they start to breed, right? You hear the word they're henned up um, a lot. Um, kind of walk me through like how a Tom, how many, well, sorry, let me rephrase that. How many, uh, I know they're probably all different, but how many hens typically do Tom's breed or is it just, just a random number per, per Tom. And then also kind of how they act, right. When it comes to being henned up, is that a thing where they're henned up with a a hen all you know day, they might branch off middle of the day and they come back and they're there all night roosting next to them. And then they fly down there right with them. Is that, is that yeah. kind of how that process works? And is that yeah. early or does that happen late or is that the whole time during breeding season? Yeah. So what you see is it changes as the spring progresses. So when people say birds are henned up, that's, that's early in the breeding process. That's, that's a group of hens. Like we were talking about it. That's a social group of hens that have split out of a winter flock and they're hanging around together. Uh, let's say there's five of them there's five hens and there's three toms hanging around with them. Um, the reason that they're henned up is because those hens are being receptive to copulating, to breeding with, with one or more of those toms, typically one, the dominant breeder. And the reason they're just shadowing them is because they're receptive. So that's why, you know, in many, in many cases, it's hard to get a, a hand up Tom to, you know, to leave those hands because they're receptive. And why would he leave if, you know, if they're receptive to him? And so that, that's an early breeding period scenario. And then what you'll see is as those hens start going to lay, um, like we were talking about earlier and Mm -hmm. that five becomes four and then three and then, you know, one, and then they're all gone. Yeah. Then that's when those toms will start behaving a little more erratically. That's when he may go looking for hens. He may be, you know, I've seen, I've seen this a number of times at 10 o'clock in the morning, a bird that you couldn't do anything with at seven, you know, I kill him at 10, 10 30. And, and it, that's yeah. why, because yeah. he, those lady friends have left him. Uh, and he's searching for breeding opportunities. And, and that's also why we see scenarios where you, you set up and worked a bird at daylight and he flew down with some hens and left. 
And then, you know, a couple hours later, he comes back to where you were. And that's because he, he knew you were there, but he was going to follow those receptive hens until they were gone. And then he goes and starts looking for other opportunities. And um, so it kind of changes to your original question. It kind of changes as the season progresses yeah. to where you get in the nesting season and a lot of your toms are, are, are alone. They don't have hens with them at all. And in those scenarios, sometimes they're pretty receptive or they go to places in their range where they think they may encounter hens. And that's why you'll often see birds that, are alone yeah you know, or maybe they're with a buddy and for reasons that are inexplainable you know they fly down and go away from you and head a half mile down the road well that's because in some previous day they interacted with a hen there and they're going back to that spot to strut and display to see if they can you know repeat that process that's what they're doing and i guess i didn't realize their how smart their recollection of places were Um, that's something I didn't know that they could, you know, recollect, Hey, I I'm in this tree, but you know, down the hill, kind of around the corner of the farm, I interacted with a hen there. So he's hopping straight down. He remembers to go down there and and go to that same area then, huh? Oh yeah. We see, we see birds that we, you know, we, we've had work where we GPS, we had hunters wear GPS, you know, and GPS units and I mean, we've had a number of situations where a hunter was interacting with a bird and, and couldn't get, get couldn't get yeah. the bird to respond. And three or four hours later, the bird ends up right where the hunter was at. I mean, they someone explained to me one time a, a colleague who's now retired that that imprinted birds to himself and, and watched them in captivity. And he would actually take these birds out as like their mother, and he would walk with them and he was explaining to me several years ago that they have an incredible sense of place. In other words, they, they interact with something and they don't forget it. They, they just recall that, okay, there was some, you know, there was a stick there or there was a wire there. He, he had a, a story one day I thought was really, really interesting. He said, um, he, he would go out with these birds and he would let them forage on as they were becoming adults. And when some, every now and then one would like leave and he would have to go find it, like follow it and come on, let's go back home. Mm -hmm. And one day this, this, this hen ended up way off from the rest of the birds and, and he couldn't get her to come back that, that evening. And she ended up roosting away, way away from the facility that they were housed in. And these birds knew every night, you know, they would just come back into their enclosures and they would roost in those enclosures. Well, this bird was quote unquote lost. And the next morning, um, she flew down. He had a radio pack. He had a radio on her. Yeah. The next morning, instead of taking the route that she had been taking for, for months to get back home from that area, she went straight, literally straight as an arrow. She knew exactly where she was going. She literally walked a straight path back to that enclosure rather than taking the, you know, the country mile approach. Yeah. Yeah. She knew exactly where she was heading and she knew exactly how to get there. And she had the compass to do it. Um, That's what he was was meaning by an incredible sense of place. Yeah. I don't think I realized that at all. And that's incredible hearing that because would you, would you even say, obviously an encounter with a hunter is something that's implanted for a long, long time with them as well oh yeah if the encounter is one that ends up in a negative experience yes yeah yeah i mean we've had we've had birds that were bumped by hunters that the bird you know took off and went miles after that encounter and didn't come back to that (laughs) to that area um so there's no question that some some sometimes perceive an encounter with a hunter negative enough that they change where they're i mean they they leave that that yeah. area and they may or may not come back that spring we see this all the time with with birds on public land 
as soon as hunting season starts, they move to private in holdings where there's less pressure and they stay there until the season's over. And then they go back to where they, where they were. Yeah, that's tough. I mean, that's tough. Then you're going to kill one on public, but actually that's a good point. What you brought up earlier about if it's a bad encounter with a hunter. So this is important because I know a lot of people don't run and gun turkey hunting, you know, they, they, they put their blind up in their best spot. They go sit in that blind all day. So you would saying if you would say if 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 you have that spot that you love and there's a bad encounter, pick up and change your spot for the rest of for the rest of or for a week or two weeks or the rest of the season. Would you say that be something that would be smart for anybody that's out there listening to? If you have a bad encounter in an area, they're probably going to remember that area. Yes and no, and the the yes is the obvious that yeah, yeah. he yeah. he he's going to recall that something bad happened there. The no is that we see routinely that that the toms will vacate a roost location, for instance, and go to some other parts of their home range, and another tom will come in and and start using that roost location. We see that all the time. Okay. So I wouldn't give up on areas per se. You know, if you know you're hunting the same bird. If you know that, I mean, I yeah. know, for instance, I, I, I was in this scenario this season. Yeah. I know I'm hunting these, the same three birds. They're together. They got one in this spot. They do this, they do that. Well, they had a negative experience where one of those birds got shot by us. Okay. Yeah. Well, go figure the other two birds changed their behavior. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it makes sense. So I'm, I doubt I'm going to be able to take the same approach and kill one of those other two. We're going to have to move to a different location and, you know, find another bird to hunt. And we did, but, um, but I've also, I've, I've hunted birds that now knowing what I know now, it ended up being different birds and that I thought was the same bird. One day they flew down and did something. And the next day they flew down and did something completely different. And I think it's probably because I was hunting two different birds and just assumed it was one. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's a good piece right there. I never thought about that. Then even though someone leaves that spot, another Tom, now that's, what's tough about Turkey hunting. You know, a lot of people have 50, hundred acres and that's a, a good chunk of land, but you know, it takes a lot. You know, I was fortunate enough growing up. My dad had property and the neighbors let me Turkey hunt. I was more on the neighbors chasing turkeys than I was on my own you know, fathers, they just have their, their core areas. And, and mm-hmm. that makes sense. Now that you say that they have their core areas, I've seen it time and time again, them being in a, in a spot. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, this is awesome. I, I do have a couple more, um, here. Let's see what time. Yeah. We're getting close to that hour, but, um, a couple more questions to kind of wrap this up. Um, when it comes to hens, um, and you talked about this a little bit when they're, they're getting bred, and they're going through that process. I've seen some times where I've called, right? A hen, you know, yelping um, for a tom. And the hen comes to me before a tom. And the tom just comes with that hen he's with. Mm-hmm. Yep. We've killed, I've killed a turkey. Seen tur- turkeys killed that way. Uh, what's going through a hen's head where they're like, is that something where like, that's another hen? What, what, what's making them want to come to you and bring that tom? And obviously the tom's coming with them. Yeah. Yeah, that we think, and it's logical to me, that is her challenging who you are. She doesn't know who you are. She, a lot of times you'll see, you know, those hens are aggressive. They, they come towards you calling at you because they don't know who you are and you're in their area and they're, they're not happy about it. So they, they come to check you out and figure out, you know, what you're doing and who you are and, you know, we know that turkeys recognize each other based on their calls and their, their, their head. Mm-hmm. You know? um, yep. So if she doesn't know who you are vocally, she wants to come and figure out who you are and look, take a look at you. And sometimes, as you say, that gets a Tom killed because he's yep. just shadowing her and he's going to go wherever she takes him. And if she takes him up to you, you know, he's dead. Um, but that, that is usually what you're dealing with is an aggressive hen that's trying to figure out who you are. It's funny you say that because about the aggressiveness, the first turkey I saw do it ran past 
uh, obviously the decoy because our, our calls were up in, in, underneath these cedar trees and ran into the cedar tree where the, the I was 15 feet to my right and my hunting partner who had the gun, the hen ran up about a foot in front of his barrel and slammed on the brakes before she realized what she saw. And then she just backed up and stayed about 20 yards out in front of him. Um, and then that Tom just, just worked his way in the whole time. So she came in aggressive, like the most aggressive I've seen a hen. So that makes sense now that they do that. I've always wondered, I think we killed our turkey this year um, with that same thing. It was just a weird situation where a turkey came up to my right where I couldn't see within like a yard. My hunting partner kind of looked at me. He said he couldn't tell if it was a Tom or, or hen, but we didn't hear any gobbles. I think it was a hen that came in real close to me to check me out. And we seen there were some heads moving below us. So he just stood up over the, the little knoll and there was one Tom and two hens. So I think the same situation happened where I brought her in to check me out and, and it was killed. Very so, likely. Yeah. Yeah. So that's interesting, but yeah. Awesome. Well, I, I can't thank you enough for jumping on here and kind of diving in. I could talk to you for hours, um, which I know you're busy. So I, I appreciate your time and, and jumping on.